Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to The Prescription, the Tax Policy Center's bi-weekly webcast on fiscal policy for the COVID-19 economy. This is one of a series of conversations with state, local, and federal government officials, as well as leading economists and other experts. I'm your host, Howard Gleckman, a senior fellow at TPC and editor of our blog, TaxVox. Our guest today is former IRS Commissioner Charles Rosati. Mr. Rosati was IRS Commissioner from 1997 to 2002, but his background was not in tax. He was co-founder and for several years CEO of American Management Systems, a technology and management consulting firm. He currently is a senior advisor at the Carlisle Group and is a member of TPC's Leadership Council. Uh, earlier this year, he proposed an ambitious plan for modernizing tax compliance and assistance at the IRS. Before we begin, our usual bit of housekeeping. We encourage audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box. Uh, when you do, please identify yourself and your organization. Uh, this event is being recorded and it will be posted online at TPC's website in the near future. And if you'd like to join the conversation on social media, please use the hashtag live at urban. Commissioner Rosati, welcome to the prescription. It's good to see you again. Let's start by talking about how the IRS is doing uh, during the pandemic. Uh, it's faced enormous challenges, including two months in the spring when staff were unable to work at IRS facilities. It's now digging its way out of massive amounts of unopened mail, it's still processing tax year 2019 tax returns. And it was asked in March to make stimulus payments to what turned out to be more than 150 million people. Overall, how would you grade the agency? Well, I'd say that the, the good news is, and it is important, is that they did the most important thing that they had to do in the very difficult circumstances, they got it done. They, for the most part, processed the returns coming in in the filing season. Uh, and they got out, uh, as you said, those uh, economic relief payments. Um, at the same time that they were essentially operating, you know, under severe restrictions because of the COVID. So that's no small feat. Um, and you have to say that, you know, the team there did a great job in, in pulling that off, uh, which is very important for, for the recovery of the economy and for just keeping the tax system going. But the other side of it, that's about all they could do. Um, and as you noted, uh, Howard, they do have a huge backlog uh, of just ordinary processing because for the most part, they have not processed anything that came in on paper. Um, and even the things that didn't come on paper, they have necessarily fully finished and pretty much all outgoing enforcement activities, uh, you know, were, were stopped until, until just very recently they started to resume some of them. So, you know, that's the situation that exists now. Um, so e even before COVID, the IRS was under a lot of stress. Uh, and I think one of the questions is, is Congress asking the IRS to do too much with the resources it has? Just one example that, that, that one of my colleagues sent along was in May, uh, Treasury Inspector General reported that over the last three years, nearly 900,000 high income non-filers with $46 billion due yeah. were not being pursued. Yeah. And 10 billion of that yeah. came from the top 10, 100 repeat non-filers. So we'll talk about your specific yeah. reform ideas in a minute, but couldn't the agency do more to close the tax gap just if it had more money? Well, it could. It definitely could. I mean, if you look longer term, I did an analysis that go back 25 years and it's been a steady erosion. You know, it's a little bit like the frog, you know, that's in the pot and the water goes up gradually. It doesn't notice it until it's too late. And then, it, you know, it gets so hot, he, he, it's too late to jump out. So if you look at it, it's been roughly speaking over 25 years, about a 35% reduction in resources and about a 30% increase just in the sheer numbers of returns, but actually more than that in workload because of the complexity. So yeah, you can pick on any one thing and say, well, we didn't do non-filers, um, but you can look at the whole, the whole compliance uh, landscape and see that, you know, in 2019, before all this, the tax gap was about 574 billion, which is an enormous number. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's been growing every year. So yes, I mean, you could always reallocate to do more against non-filers, but you do less against something else. I mean, the IRS doesn't even, you know, have the resources to process all of the information, you know, all of the matching cases that it has where it knows, you know, essentially that there's missing income. 
So that's just a fact. Um, but if you look going forward, if I could just add one more thing, there's some new challenges even now because let's say on the large business sector, as part of the CARES Act, uh, the Congress allowed uh, five years of carrybacks for corporate tax losses for the, the last, during this period of losses. So what are we gonna have in the large corporate sector? We're gonna have an avalanche of gigantic refund claims from businesses that lost gigantic amounts of money as during the crisis. But as you can see in the stock market, there's plenty of especially technology businesses that are making unprecedentedly big profits. And they're the ones that have, you know, the greatest flexibility to reallocate that money, for example, overseas and other places. So that's, that's just on the corporate sector. And that's really mostly not even part of the tax gap. They're going to have a huge challenge there. And then as far as the regular, you know, ordinary run of the mill compliance, I mean, just digging out of the backlog, you can't take half a year off and expect to not lose anything. So I, I would expect that, you know, whatever the situation was, it's, it's going to be, you know, even more dire, you know, over the next couple of years, it, it, assuming it just stays the same situation. I guess on the corporate side, one of the big challenges the agency has is it's lost a lot of its most experienced staff. And now it's asking relatively inexperienced people to deal with yeah. even more complicated issues on the, on the corporate side, as you noted. Well, well I mean, actually, I, I, that is, that's an excellent point, Howard, but it's even broader than that, because as you can tell, um, and I don't have statistics on this, but, you know, as a result of the COVID crisis, I believe that the attrition rate has gone up, uh, you know, across the board. And so the, the people that are there are left doing more. So there's a rebuilding, but, you know, there would have been a rebuilding anyway, but now there's going to be even more of a rebuilding. We're, we're not in a good situation as far as tax administration is concerned. You know, there's just no doubt about it. I mean, a lot of the money keeps coming in because you have withholding and, you know, you have a lot of income that's, that's you know, on a book people can't avoid uh, you know, paying taxes on. But beyond that, we don't have the resources or the programs that we need. On well, the other side of the ledger, uh, for, for, for years, as you well know, uh, lawmakers of both parties give lip service to simplification. But every time they pass legislation, yeah. it seems to make the code even more complicated. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the basic yeah. question, is the Internal Revenue Code just too complicated for the IRS to administer? You know, um, it's an interesting theoretical question, but, you know, it doesn't lead to anywhere, I don't think, because nobody has really proposed. I mean, we did have some simplification on the individual side by having the standard deduction increase, as you know, that takes some people out. So that's, you know, you could say that's a simplification. But on the business side, I mean, and this is a longer topic, as I really don't think that there, especially for larger businesses, there's any way that you would ever solve this problem without changing the definition of income to be something that is more aligned with the way companies report, you know, to their shareholders and creditors that has external audits and has a standard because, you know, the, 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 the um, complexity and, and, the, and the differences is really, is really, you know, what creates the opportunity for uh, minimizing taxes. So that's a longer topic and a much bigger topic, but I think that in, the, on the, in terms of the business side, especially large businesses, that's really the only route that I think could ever, ever really make a big dent in solving that part of the problem. But on the individual side, thankfully, you know, we did get the, the individual deduction, the standard deduction increase. So that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's another issue I wanted to ask you about uh, before we get to your proposal. And, and that's a, a a, 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 to me, a very troubling issue. We're living at a time when much of the federal government is at risk of being politicized. The Postal it's Service what? sent the risk of being politicized. The, the Postal Service, oh, the Census, the Justice Department, yeah. even the military. And I wonder, do you worry yeah. about political influence affecting the ability of the IRS to do its job? You know, uh, I really, you know, barring some other change that might happen that I haven't seen yet, I really don't. Uh, you know, you might be surprised at that, but that's one place where the IRS is really resilient. Um, it's really quite resilient. You know, there's a lot of things that you can criticize, but the entire culture of the IRS is, is extremely resistant to any form of uh, um, let's turn on external influence or, or, or uh, politicalization, I would say, uh, through many things. You have, of course, the, 
the IG, which, you know, we still have an IG, which is focused a thousand people just on auditing the IRS. Um, the, you know, the culture internally is very focused. There's a lot of education that, and just, you know, tradition and, 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 and education that goes with uh, making it clear how things will be done. So, you know, anything could happen in the future, but as of now, I mean, I really don't worry about that too much inside the IRS. That might be one of the few good things, uh, good news things that I could say. It could, not that it couldn't change, but it would take a hell of a lot of work to change that. That's good to hear. Uh, speaking of the Postal Service, the IRS still does an enormous amount of its business by mail. Uh, almost all of its taxpayer communications are on paper. Will the problems at the USPS damage the IRS's ability to communicate with taxpayers? And how can, how can the IRS address that? Well, if, they, the mail, if the mail is delayed, sure. Uh, if the mail is delayed, yeah, yes, it will. But, um, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, uh, I think with technology, we could really make a big dent in. And I will say that the one, one you know, uh, silver lining, let's call it, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the COVID thing is that the IRS is doing more work uh, remotely. It's even audits. Uh, it's allowing exchange of documentation. It does have some technology programs to, that are in place and being scaled up to have more of the communication with taxpayers be electronic. And so the answer is for now, of course, yes, they're dependent on the Postal Service to a significant extent. If that is delayed, then it's gonna be a problem. But that is a solvable problem, you know, in the relatively near term. Let, let's talk about your IRS reform plan. Uh, you say that with better tax player reporting and better use of data, the IRS could reduce the tax gap by $1.6 trillion over the next decade. That's a big number, but let, let's start, if you could just briefly describe your plan for, for our viewers. Yeah. Well, it, it's really very, you know, there's complexity in how you would implement it, but the idea is very simple. As you know from IRS studies, that the biggest part of the tax gap, the, the, the amount of income that is not reported and which taxes are not paid, is very heavily determined by how visible that income is, which is the IRS word, meaning how much is reported by third parties. For income that is fully reported by third parties, like wages, pensions, and most dividends and interest, you've got 95 to 100% compliance rate. For some income, especially certain kinds of business income, which is not reported at all, you know, the, the reporting rate's less than half. I mean, that's a huge difference. And if you look at where the tax gap is, which is big as it is, that's the biggest part of it. So the proposal that I am suggesting is, is, is really just building on that simple principle by saying that where we don't have visibility because we don't have reporting, we would institute some additional reporting. I get into the details of that. And then, but that would also require some new technology because even as I said now, that the IRS doesn't even use all the information it has. I mean, one example, it doesn't even process all the matching cases, which it could do because it doesn't have the resources. And that's partly staffing, but it's also partly old technology. But then you look at some things they have now. We have, I've forgotten, 40 million, I think it is, K-1s that come in, which are, you know, you, you know what K-1s are, the reports from partnerships and so forth. The IRS doesn't have any automation to deal with those. I mean, the only time those are ever used is if somebody pulls them up in an audit. There's no reason that couldn't be done. Now, that does require more complex technology. I actually had a pilot project when I was commissioner. It didn't really work because we didn't have the technology. That's an example. And so with some additional reporting on this low visibility income, together with, you know, an upgrade of technology, and it's not, you know, rocket science technology. It's stuff that's already being used. The IRS, for example, has one really good project program that it's done that GAO is credited them for to use more... Um, effective technology on screening, you know, fraudulent refund claims. It's gotten some real pro progress on that. Um, that's the kind of technology we're talking about. And, you know, with the two of those things together, now you said 1.6 trillion. Yeah, it's a big number over 10 years. But all it says is that after 10 years of work, if we invested in it, we would reduce the tax gap by 29%, you know, over compared to what it would be. You know, if we if, if that's if that's too big a challenge for the United States of America, then I, I, I think there's something wrong. It's just that, you know, unfortunately, there's an air of resignation, like we can't do anything about this. But actually, we could. Now, it's not a quick fix. It would take, you know, it would take a sustained effort. And I think it would take some legislation, you know, similar to, for example, what Congress passed in 1998, 
that mandated electronic filing, you know, which nobody thought could be done in, but now we're all electronic filing. So if you got a correct mandate from Congress and, you know, you put the right leadership in, I am really confident that you could do it. Not, you know, not quick fix, but over a 10 year period, there's a lot you can do. And, and the techniques are completely known. It's just applying them more broadly. So, so you, you had five years as a commissioner, you dealt with Congress. It, it strikes me that the, 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 the IRS is one of those agencies that has no friends in Congress. Nobody wants to step up and say, you know, yeah. I support giving the IRS more money so it can do a better job getting compliance from taxpayers. How do you convince Congress that yeah. this is important enough to do? Well, well, first of all, uh, let me just say that it's not a job for the IRS commissioner to do that. Okay. I mean, it's, the IRS commissioner has to help. But if you want to make a significant improvement in, you know, the way that the tax system is managed, it's going to take leadership from, you know, from a presidential administration, the secretary of the treasury, and, you know, recruiting some leaders in Congress. And, you know, whether that will be done or could be done, uh, you know, I'm not the you know, that's a, <laughs> something for somebody else to say, but should it be done? Well, let me, let me just, let me just mention a couple of things on a broader base that I've looked at, you know, just from some recent stuff that the CBO and the Committee for Responsible Budgeting has come out with. I mean, we were already in a situation before the COVID crisis, before the COVID crisis, where over 10 years period, mandatory spending and interest was going to consume over 90% of all of our tax revenues. And then we were going to borrow another 30% to pay for everything else. Okay. Well, that was already before. If you look at what the latest thing is, you know, the economy's weaker, revenues are going to be less, you know, they're giving tax refunds to corporations. It's probably going to be more like 40%. So mandatory spending is going to consume almost all the tax revenue. And then we have to borrow another 40% forever, you know, just to pay the bills for everything else. And that's before anybody does anything new. So, you know, I mean, if you look at what, what I was suggesting, it's not a magic solution but almost anything that you want to do to either fund new programs or, or deal with the fiscal situation, you require a, a more sound tax system than we have now. And, you know, just to give an example, I mean, and I'm not saying this is an alternative, but the proposal that I made, I, I believe is, is accurate and I believe conservative in our numbers, but that money would, that, that would, would be raised from doing that tax gap would be almost as much as President Biden's proposal, which he has three parts, you know, one is social security tax, one's the individual taxes, the other is corporate. You just take the social security raise and the individual raise, the, the, the tax gap proposal I made would raise almost as much as those two combined. It wouldn't cover the corporate side. But, uh, you know, I'm not saying that's the only thing you can do, but we're going to have to do something. And I don't know why it would be fair myself to raise taxes on the people that are already compliant you know, before you do something, you know, to, to, that you can do to at least collect the taxes that are already in the books. And that's all I'm saying. And, you know, what, I, I can't make that happen. And I don't think any IRS commissioner alone can make that happen. But I think it would take some political leadership, you know, to make that case that it makes sense to do this. It's just sensible to do that before you do anything else, or at least as part of doing anything else. That's my, that's my pitch and I'm sticking to it. Okay, good deal. Um, let's dig into the details of the plan a little bit. So the first feature of your plan yeah. would require banks to report more income and expense information for their clients that are sole proprietors or small yeah. businesses. W why yeah. do you target those firms? Well, I'm just looking where the, it's not targeting firms. I'm just targeting, I'm just saying income that is not reported by third parties is where, you know, the biggest part of the tax gap is. So I'm just filling in the gaps, filling in the holes where there's no third party reporting. It's as simple as that. You know, if anybody has income that's third party reported, they wouldn't have to do anything. So, you know, if you've already got, for example, you know, dividends or interest or capital gains, and that's reported on a 1099, you don't have to do anything. But if you've got income that, you know, may not be reported, then there's a, a way to fill in those holes. And, you know, the way to do it is through, through banks. That's, it's just putting everybody on an equal footing. Mm -hmm. so, so small businesses inevitably are going to complain that this will be burdensome and are going to add to their costs. Yeah. Are they right? Yeah. Is it, is it going to add something to their? Well, to their... I, I don't want to preview. I don't want to preview too much, but I'll tell you, if, Tech, check tax notes on September 14th, because I've got a second article coming out that's going to explain in gory detail. We've even got a model that explains exactly how many minutes it's going to take for everybody to do this. 
<laughs> so watch out for tax notes on September 14th. So is, is, that uh, number of, is, it, is that number of minutes relatively small? Is it less than 10? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's not less than 10, but relatively speaking to what they do. And, and in reality, you know, we've estimated this based on manual effort. What would really happen is, you know, the tax software industry would simply add another schedule to their tax software and, and automate it. So it's not really anything significant. Um, I, I don't think that's, you know, but in order to address that, and uh, I don't, I, I, it's too long to go into here, but I, I do want to give a plug to people who read the article because it really does go into this. And in addition to the article, uh, we're going to publish a new website, an additional website that has real detail if you want to really find out everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that, that the real, the bottom line for people to think about is that, you know, if you want to think about fairness and what's good for taxpayers, most business taxpayers pay 100% of what they owe and report. Most of them do. So why should some of them do that? And another, you know, large percentage just basically because just because there's no reporting, not do it. Wage earners do it. People that are on pensions do it. Most business people do it. Why is there, why is there gaps that were just left unfilled when, when, you know, in the past, maybe it was not possible to fill those holes easily, but today it is. I mean, that's, 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 that's the point. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the second element of your plan requires the IRS to make better use of big data to analyze returns, identify audit targets. Explain to the audience how that would work. Okay, the way to think about it is just uh, a, a more extensive amount of what the IRS already does with 1099s and W-2s. Okay, so right now the IRS has, you know, very rudimentary technology to match one line on a return. You know, if you get the 1099 that said you had, you know, so much interest from a bank or, you know, and, and you didn't report it, you know, they can match that and send you a notice saying, basically all we're doing is scaling that up. Now it gets complicated. I mentioned K, uh, you know, K-1s. I mean, there's a huge amount of income that comes in on K-1s from partnerships and S-corps and any kind of pass-throughs, which is uh, not matched, you know. It, the inf information is there, but it can't be used because the technology, you know, it, it's complicated. You know, it requires, if you've looked at a K-1, you know, exactly how many lines there are and where they go. So you need somebody like a revenue agent, you know, or somebody, you know, more skilled to, to, to do that manually. The technology that's available today, readily available today, can do that kind of analysis. You know, it's kind of like thinking about if you had an unlimited supply of, you know, auditors or agents, to match up, and I'm using the examples of K1 because people understand that, but in the new technology, the new proposal I had, there would be more reports like K1s um, that, would, uh, that would just match these things, that's all. It's just that, you know, the, the, the technology that is available now can only do that on a very limited scale. And you, there's no reason, you know, with reasonable investments that it can't be scaled up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's so all it really other... boils down to. One of the other areas of, of, of real inefficiency is, is, you know, you have a return that's got a, a transposed number on it, uh, you know, right. and, and it doesn't, because of that, it doesn't match some reporting. Now the IRS has to deal with that manually. Uh, is there a better way for the service to address those kinds of that, that, that's, that's why I call my proposal tax compliance and assistance. You notice it has tax compliance, that's exactly the point, is, you know, if you look at uh, Nina Olson's most last report that she did, you know, the taxpayer advocate, she has, a, you know, a, a really effective discussion of what's wrong with, for example, IRS notices, you know, math error notices you're talking about, or, you know, initial station of deficiency. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad to read that, okay, because it's showing, you know, in gory detail exactly what it doesn't tell the taxpayer and how complicated it is. That can all be fixed, you know, the technology exists to do that, to, to, to figure out the same thing that a clerk would do, basically. It's just taking a machine to do what a clerk would do, or maybe even a, a, an agent, you know, a, a, a semi-skilled agent, and, and, and figuring that out. Furthermore, as you said, then how do you resolve it with the taxpayer? Well, do you have to do that for paper? No. I mean, the IRS has already started up, you know, better ways of providing electronic communication on their accounts with certain taxpayers. That can be 
done, you know, probably 95% of that over time could be done through electronic communication if you did need to resolve it. So those are all doable things. And, you know, I, I don't want to criticize the IRS, but because they know this, by the way. They, it's not like, and some of them they're doing. You should read the GAO report on what they've done with the, um, you know, uh, fraudulent refund screening and what they've done, you know, to begin to, you know, provide electronic communication on accounts. It's not that they don't know it. They just don't have the commitment, you know, from the, 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 the direction, let's say, and, and the resources to, 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 to fully execute it. But, but they can do it. Uh, not immediately, but I'm talking about a 10-year program. And, and how much technology, how much new technology would the service have to buy? You know, for 30 years, I've been hearing about the IRS, you know, getting new technology and, and it never quite happens. Or by the time it buys it, it's out of date because the procurement process is so inefficient. Would it have to actually purchase a lot of new technology to make this work? Well, I mean... Yes, it would have to purchase new technology, but a lot of it is more applying technology. The purchasing is really the pretty easy part, okay, actually. Um, it's more applying it, you know, to, uh, to the, the, the problems that I'm talking about. And once again, I will, I will uh, put in a plug for my article on September because we are going into glory detail about exactly which technology they need, how they're going to do it. I mean, it lays out the cost year by year, point by point. So, if you want to find out about technology, you can read all about it on September 14th. But it sounds like what you're saying, Charles, is this is really more a matter of business processes than it is about, about hardware. It, it, it is. It's, it's business processes enabled by technology. In other words, you know, you, you think, well, I'll just a simple one, ma take matching. They already have matching. They already have a thing. It's, you know, really old, very oversimplified technology. It's the best you had 25 years ago. It's still the mm -hmm. same, pretty much. They've done some things in some places where they've upgraded. It's been very successful. You know, the, 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 the best one example is the, is the fraudulent refunds and the overclaims on, on refunds. I mean, they got a 15 to 20 times return on the technology they put in there, as described by GAO. Mm -hmm. They know what to do. I mean, they know how to, I mean, they would need some more you know, people to help manage it, you know, and of course they would need that. But what you need at the top level is direction from Congress you know, a mandate from Congress, similar to what they did in RA 98, and then of course follow through on funding. And if you do that, it's not a mystery. It's not rocket science. It's, you know, basic, good, solid stuff that, you know, any large scale business or government agency can do. So we just have a few minutes left. Let me ask you about the ROI on this. Uh, you, you, as we mentioned, have, have, have estimated that your proposal would generate 1.6 trillion over 10 years. Uh, CBO has looked at similar, not the same, but similar structural reforms and concluded it would generate far less, less than $100 billion. So what accounts for this difference and, and why are you yeah, so well, confident? That's, that's, there's, no, there's nothing, you know, I've read the CBO, there's nothing, what, there's nothing comparable whatsoever. The CBO is just a trap. I think they're a little conservative on their numbers, but basically they just extrapolated uh, traditional auditing uh, you know, resources, which is not going to solve the tax gap problem. I mean, th the difference is take a look. If you look at what the IRS gets on matching programs, it's like 25 to one. What it gets on audits is three to one, four to one. So there's a, you know, you can see the difference right there. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, for those who are skeptical and want to do it in our website, in conjunction with our article, we've got appendices and spreadsheets that show exactly how that, how those costs are going to be done. But our best estimate is that it would be, you know, over a 10 year period, about a 25 to one return, which is not far off from what they get currently from matching. But we also did a worst case scenario where the cost doubled and it took longer and, you know, everything went wrong. And that comes down to a 12 to one return. Okay. Well, we are out of time. Uh, Charles Rosati, thank you so much for joining us and, and, and sharing your proposal with us. Uh, and it'll be interesting to yeah. see uh, as time goes on what happens. Thanks very yep. much. Thank you. Okay, yeah, take bye. care. Yeah.